Today is June 8th, 2017, and my name is Allison Thompson. I'm the director at Marshall Public Library, and I am here on behalf of the Friends of the Library as part of their oral history project. And I'm talking today with Dr. James Turner and um, the history of uh, Cork Medical Center and his role in it over over the years. And so thank you for taking the time You're to welcome. talk with me today and I, I look forward to hearing more about it, so please. Well, as most of us grew up in Marshall, what we had at that time were two small doctor's offices, um, uh, both located near the center of town. Dr. Ilias and Dr. Mitchell were the two local physicians. Both of them were very busy. Uh, Dr. Mitchell's office was actually his father's office, who was a physician, and Dr. Mitchell also had a, a cousin who was a dentist here in town that we went to also. My dad always called him Molers, so that, that, the other Dr. Mitchell. And, um, uh, but Dr. Mitchell had an office right off the courthouse square, and Dr. Ilias' office was about a block um, south of the courthouse uh, on 6th Street. Both very busy. Uh, they cared for all the people in the, in the generalized area. They were, would be considered family practitioners today. Both of them delivered babies at one time. And uh, Dr. Mitchell also liked to do surgery. And oftentimes he would do surgery in the morning if he had any patients having surgery. And then would come to Marshall. The way things were in their offices at those times, you did not make an appointment. And I can remember you want oral histories. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. I can remember one time as a young boy, I was probably eight or nine years old and had an earache. We spent our summers at the local swimming pool and most likely had a swimmer's ear. And uh, my mom told me to go up to Dr. Mitchell's office. So this is what America was like back then. Uh, I just got on my bicycle, a stingray, of course, and uh, rode up to his office. No money in my hand, no anything like that. Probably eight or nine years old. The office, the way things were there, you went there early and you signed up on a book. And then he would see people as, as you signed up. So people went early. Some people we would sit there for three or four hours. So I can remember the office was terribly cold, had air, air conditioning in the summer, and had that old-time medicine doctor's office smell that you knew there was something creepy in the back, but <laughs> you didn't know what it was. So I'm sitting there, a little blonde-haired kid with a flat top and a, and a piece of cotton hanging out my ear, and I'm sitting in a chair with, I'm sure my feet don't even touch the floor. It's like a Norman Rockwell picture, waiting for Dr. Mitchell to arrive. And I can hear this, and I barely knew him, but I can hear this sound from the back. And for those who knew Dr. Mitchell, he had a cigar in his mouth all the time, even when he was seeing patients. And I can hear this rumble come out of the back room. Where the hell is the Turner kid at? And I just <laughs> jumped right up out of the chair. I thought, my God, you know. Of course, there were six of us kids, and, and George knew all of us, so I jumped up out of my chair. He took a look at my ear. He didn't have the most gentle hand, as I recall at that time. He kind of made me almost a little bit tearful. He put a little antibiotic wick in my ear, and he said, um, come back tomorrow. Don't go swimming either. So I go outside to get on my bicycle ride home. Nobody ever changed hands. There were no insurance policies. I didn't have any money. I didn't pay anybody. I don't know how it happened. <laughs> so the next day, I just sat around, and I couldn't go swimming in the middle of the summer. So I rode my bike up the next day, and the same thing happened. So... Again, I took no money. I don't know who paid who or whatever happened, but he, he took care of me. The, um, the idea was kind of taking across uh, around the country. Part of it, I think, was driven by the progression of the interstate system, that uh, when the interstate was coming through America, it, it created new businesses, even from gas stations to local things. And so commerce picked up. Um, and I think there was an idea that we're going to be able to grow some of these smaller communities that are now connected that were never connected before. And also, medicine had advanced a great deal. Um, the job of being a physician in the early 20th century would not have been a very good job. You didn't have much to offer people. Um, but as um, the era of Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Ilias, they saw the advent of antibiotics. They, they came in just after World War II. They would have seen the advent of um, vaccinations and really... Most of them did not come in until the early 60s. Um, the year I was born, 1952, was actually the highest year of polio outbreak in the country. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the President of the United States had polio. And so mothers, I'm sure my mother at that time would have had five children, was frightened about a polio epidemic uh, breaking out. And then we look at the advances in the early 60s. We all went to the high school gymnasium and had some purple liquid on a drop of a sugar cube, and polio disappeared from the United States. So technology was taking off, surgical ability and so forth, and physicians were being trained better. Um, 
And I think a vision that we're going to have growth of, you know, improved medical centers, not just little doctor's offices. I think the vision for Cork Medical Center um, partly was because of those advances. And the theory was, um, could we somehow bring better medical care to the rural areas rather than people go to the cities? Um, in Marshall, the, the, the discussion was really held between Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Williams had passed away, which really put a real crunch on him, a, a real stress. Um, so much so that a young man, Dr. Jim Buechler, was a Marshall High School graduate. Uh, Dr. Mitchell had worked with him. He graduated from the University of Illinois and then did his residency near Chicago, but then was uh, drafted into the, into the Navy. And uh, things were so desperate in Marshall that they were able to get Dr. Buechler released early from the Navy to come to Marshall to take care of that workload. Dr. Buechler stayed here for several years and eventually moved to Terre Haute and developed our Family Medicine Center. He became the first director of Union Hospital's Family Practice Center, which just um, um, had its um, celebrated its 40th anniversary last year. And we've now graduated over 180 physicians from that uh, residency program, started from a, um, a Marshall High School graduate. Uh, and it, we have residents from all the way from Japan to the South Sudan that, are, that were trained there. Um, so we were very lucky. The, uh, the idea of the Rural Medical Center was a way to bring services closer to rural people, and that would be include x-rays, and also the idea that you could bring some specialist maybe a day a week to a rural community, and uh, that was the vision for Cork Medical Center. Casey, uh, another town in our county, had a similar plan. They worked together on it. They built a building very much like ours, uh, same contractor, but on a one level, and we built a two-level building, but they opened nearly the same time in 1970. It was about the time they opened. The name comes from uh, Mrs. Cork. I don't know too much about Mrs. Cork, but um, Omer Schaller was her attorney and could give you some more information. But she had a sizable estate and was wanting to do something worthwhile. And apparently between her and Omer Schaller, the decision was made to create a fund to develop a, a medical center in Marshall. And I think the number at that time was two hundred fifty or three hundred thousand dollars, which would probably be like a million dollars today, to uh, launch a, a community uh, drive to develop a medical center. And between that and community donations, the medical center was built. As I understand, there was no government money or anything else; it was all raised by the community. Um, the medical center was built initially. The thought might even deliver babies there. They had so. Uh, a couple rooms set up where the vision was people might even stay overnight if they just needed an IV fluid. Um, and hopefully even, some, and there was a dental suite. Uh, we had dentists there at different times, an optometry suite for an op optometrist there. So it was really a, an innovation to have a multidisciplinary clinic in a one stop light town. It really had never been done before. The clinic also had an emergency room, which got busier than people wanted it to be particularly nights and weekends, and often sometimes even fairly serious accidents off the interstate would come to Marshall. The, the um, emergency room was, um, became very difficult to staff. It was really hard for two physicians to staff a place like that, nights and weekends, and nursing staff. Um, and eventually it was felt that it probably was not the best thing and that people should probably uh, go by ambulance to the major hospital rather than try to come here. We just couldn't, it just didn't have enough people that could staff it 24 7. But it was in existence for probably 10 years before they decided it probably wasn't the best thing to do. Um, one of the challenges uh, that came up to get um, specialists to come to Cork Medical Center was really based on malpractice. Um, Illinois traditionally has had one of the most challenging malpractice and still does malpractice insurance programs in the country, one of the most expensive. Indiana, partly due to the work of Dr. Otis Bowen, who was the governor of Indiana back in the early 70s, they changed their malpractice laws markedly, and Indiana is one of the best practice states for malpractice. Illinois is one of the worst. And when specialists came to Illinois to do any type of a procedure, they had to have Illinois malpractice. And so um, I think we would have had a much higher development of specialists coming, but they didn't want to pay that malpractice. And if people needed a surgical procedure, even something as simple as, say, even as a vasectomy or something fairly simple, they would have them come to their office in Tarot and do that so they wouldn't have to pay the malpractice. So that idea kind of hurt a little bit. But uh, recently, now uh, in the last several years, that has changed. And the volume has been enough that we now have um, 
a cardiologist who comes twice a month, a podiatrist who comes weekly, a nephrologist who comes monthly, um, and an oncologist who comes monthly. So they've been able to overcome some of those battles and, and bring in the services to uh, the, the rural patients. Um, the state of Illinois developed a program uh, called Rural Health Clinics. And if you look around America, traditionally, folks who live in rural areas tend to be less likely to have health insurance, tend to be sicker in general, have had less preventative health care, and tend to be more poor or poorer. So um, it would sometimes be a challenge for the physician to survive in a rural community because of those challenges. People who are sicker, uh, little health insurance, very little access to specialty care. And so it would not necessarily be the best place to go practice, particularly if you had some medical school debt. Um, it was actually a national program, and Illinois adopted it also. Cork Medical Center in the early 80s became a rural health clinic designation. And what that meant basically was that if a patient had Medicaid, uh, we would get paid, the medical center would get paid as if they had Medicare, which almost tripled the amount of funding that you could get from seeing a patient. And it was enough that rural health clinics could survive. Otherwise, um, Medicaid payments alone, you probably could not survive in that kind of a practice. So there's over 6,000 rural health clinics in America today, um, and that's really what's uh, made us to be its profitable to survive. The other thing that the states have developed, uh, Illinois and Indiana both, are rural health scholarships for medical students. Two of my colleagues used those scholarships, and they were, they're called a primary care scholarship, and basically they would uh, pay off your medical school debt if you agreed to return to an underserved area uh, a year for a year. So my colleagues have done that, and so um, they've fulfilled their commitment here. They've stayed here over four years, but um, so the taxpayers of Illinois help fund those programs to help encourage people to come to rural, to, uh, to practice in rural communities. The, um, myself, uh, of course, I grew up two blocks from the medical center, married a marshal person. Uh, so I've known the system my entire life and went through the family medicine residency that was instituted by our, our uh, hometown, Dr. Buchler, and then came here in 1989. Like most family practitioners did 30 years ago, we did everything. Uh, I delivered over 900 babies here for about 17 years. Um, we made a hospital rounds. We took care of all of our own patients. So every morning we went to the hospital, made rounds, and every weekend. Um, we had a uh, busy nursing home, over a 100-bed nursing home. We took care of the patients there. We would have Saturday morning office, and pretty much we were on call, and pretty much that's just what family practitioners did at that time. About 10 years ago, a, a system kind of swept across the country called Hospitalist. These are primarily internal medicine physicians who now work in the hospital, and the way the system works today is we would call the Hospitalist, and our patients would be admitted under them. Uh, we still do some admitting of patients in the hospital, but that system has sort of taken it over, um, and that's what's done around America today. Also, most physicians, as they get a little bit older and a family gets a little bit older, uh, doing obstetrics gets to be difficult. It's a very, it, it's just a very time-consuming part of your practice. Um, somebody may be in labor for 12, 15, 18 hours, and when you have a family and things to go to, it, gets, it can get pretty difficult. So unfortunately, more and more uh, family physicians are not doing OB. They're letting the obstetricians do that. What we're doing in our clinic now, um, since no one's delivering babies, we are seeing mothers for the first 36 weeks of their pregnancy. Full-term pregnancy is 40, so they can still get their prenatal care here rurally, and then they're transferred to the obstetrician for the last four weeks of their care. The obstetrician will do the delivery and then send mother and baby back to us. So it's still a pretty reasonable um, uh, network to provide uh, to provide rural health care. The other thing we've been involved in over the years has been teaching. We take pride in being a teaching clinic. We often have a running joke when we have medical students with us that the great teaching institutions are John Hopkins, Mayo Clinic, Cork Medical Center, and Duke University. <laughs> Duke University always calls and what are you guys doing that made you number three? Uh, but um, I would say most days of the year there's at least one student here, either nurse practitioner, uh, I've got a medical student with me now, um, and we take some pride in, uh, in being able to do that. Um, we've also been able to develop, uh, and really following Dr. Mitchell's model, 
uh, a rural medicine program for Indiana University. Uh, the University of Illinois program, which Dr. Mitchell was instrumental in starting, uh, has been there for over 40 years, and the home for it now is in Rockford, Illinois. But he was instrumental in developing the first rural medicine training program to encourage young people from rural high schools to go into medical school and in return. What they found over the years, when you look demographically, um, when you go to a rural high school, maybe your class is 50 to 100 students, you often will get the same academic opportunities that a student does in a large school. And traditionally, those students are maybe um, in the summers or out on a tractor working on a the farm. They're not going to math camp and science camp like some of these other students. And so when they enter college, they often struggle for a year or two, and it may actually hurt their grade point, even though it may be very bright. They just started off a little bit behind because they just didn't have those opportunities. And so the program was developed to look at those young people who had um, great dedication, wanted to return home, strong work ethic, their grades to return back to where they were, very bright, um, and develop a special training program for them. And that's, and University of Illinois had that program. Um, it was so admired by Indiana University, about 10 years ago, the federal government uh, told all the medical schools we're going to have a massive shortage of physicians in this country and encourage all the medical schools in the nation to increase their enrollment by at least 10%. When that happened, uh, with some of our influences, a decision made for Indiana's growth of 25 students to develop a rural program, and that's where those new 25 students would go. So it was primarily um, done really with the guidance of Dr. Jim Buechler, I served on some of the committees also, and through the uh, Richard G. Luger Center for Rural Health, really became the center where that program uh, came to fruition. Um, the Rockford program that Dr. Mitchell started was so admired that the deans of the medical school from Indiana University went to Rockford and watched their process on how that was done and really incorporated the same process for Indiana University. Um, and so that program now has uh, 75 young uh, students in it, we want to return to rural Indiana. The first class, the first two classes of the program have already graduated, and 80% of those students have stayed in primary care. So something that was started by two Marshall physicians has turned into uh, the Rockford program that's lasted for 40 years and probably has had well over 300 graduates. The Indiana University program, really mentored by Dr. Buechler, who started the Family Medicine Residency Program and continued on, now has 75 students in it, and I'm sure it will continue to be very successful. The, one of the points about a rural medicine program that we tell our state legislators and our federal legislators is there's a, there's a significant economic impact to having a physician in a rural area. The average rural physician creates 23 jobs um, and also puts it approximately $3 million into their local hospital. The time we send the patients in, they do CAT scans, MRIs, surgeries, um, we put $3 million into a hospital. So hospitals are happy to have us uh, to feed their system, um, but it's a huge impact to have a physician in a community. Without that physician, the nursing home would not be there, the, the pharmacies would not be there, your home health care could not survive, um, your uh, home health care agencies, the people who provide oxygen, nebulizer machines, and all that, let alone your office staff. Here we have um, 26 full-time employees, all the employees have a retirement plan, they have health insurance, uh, and it's really a really pretty solid job for a rural community. Many people have worked here for many years. So um, the other thing that's important is when a small industry thinks about expanding or moving to your community, they look at what's the educational resources, they look at recreation, they definitely look at what kind of a medical program a community has. If they have medical care in their community, then that's someone that can do the physicals for their employees, can be there if an employee gets injured, uh, and can be you know, part of the community with them and their growth. If they look around a small community and say there's no health care in that community, it almost gives the impression that this is not a progressive community, that they have not worked together to provide health care, and more likely they're not going to settle there. So um, it, it has a huge impact, and I think our legislators know that. have been very supportive of rural medicine programs. Both the University of Illinois and Indiana University have rural medicine scholarships uh, through the state that, uh, as I mentioned, you can go through medical school essentially debt-free and then return to the community. So you're not burdened by a huge uh, debt to repay. And, and again, when you go to a smaller area, your income is not going to be the same. You have to be a rural physician because you want to be a rural physician. 
Um, it's not about the money and so forth. You, you have to, the, the, the theme has always been that to have somebody be successful, you have to grow your own. Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Buechler have known that for years. You, you can't get somebody from a city to settle in a rural area. And the other part is you also have to settle their spouse. And today, half the physicians in medical school, half the trainees are, are women. And one of the challenges the rural areas have is most likely the spouse is highly educated also. Maybe I'll have a master's, maybe a doctor degree, maybe an engineer, some other form of, of profession. And not only do you have to find a job for the physician, but for their spouse. And sometimes in a rural area, that's difficult to do. And you lose that physician. They really want to come to your community, but the spouse has a, is with a firm or a company and, and they just can't survive in a small community. It's just not going to work for them. So you really have to sell the whole family, you know, when they come here. Um, so we've actually developed a, uh, through the School of Medicine and, and in the local community a program called BMD. It's been in uh, existence now for 20 years where you take uh, high school seniors who are from a rural community. If they have a SAT of 1,200 and a grade point of 3.5, they're interviewed at Indiana State University. And uh, if they uh, qualify for this program, they're admitted to, the, to Indiana State into a pre-medicine program. They pay no tuition. Um, they get uh, different kinds of help through the four years. Um, and if they have a reasonable uh, score on their medical uh, school aptitude test, they're admitted to the IU School of Medicine. So that program's gone on for 20 years. And uh, there have been literally 100 graduates. Can I grab that? Mm -hmm. Hello?